Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening for our final chapter of our culture unit tonight. We begin discussing ethnicity. So let's get started. We start out tonight by looking at a few different definitions. Between this slide and the next, we're going to have to define these terms. And I'm going to tell you right now that these first few slides are really, really, really important. These definitions are going to, to kind of lay the groundwork of a lot that we're going to talk about in this, this chapter. So please make a special note to, to understand these definitions that we have going forward. So the three that we're going to look at between this slide and the next are ethnicity, race, and nationality. Please make sure that you are able to differentiate those very, very well, because you're going to have to. So let's get started. We start out with ethnicity. Again, that is what this chapter is called. The chapter is not called race. The chapter is not called nationality. It's called ethnicity. So what is that? Here's the definition. Identity with a group of people that share a common ancestry and culture. Now, one really big thing, as always, we're underlining important parts of this definition. Hopefully you underlined common ancestry and probably most important in terms of differentiating this from other terms, culture. That's really important. But I also want to draw your attention to the very first word of that definition, identity. When we start talking about a, a lot of this chapter is about identity and how people identify themselves. And so it's really important that at this point we mentioned that we are talking about self-identification, how people identify themselves. And so it makes it very, very difficult to, to start to identify and accurately calculate how people are going to self-identify. Like, for example, our next lecture, we're going to give you lots of statistics about ethnicity in the United States. All of these are self-reported. And... It, it's how people feel internally, how they feel, the, the culture that they, that they feel tied to. And so that's what we're talking about in this case. Right? So I want you to keep that in mind as we look at these next couple definitions. All right? The term ethnicity comes from a Greek word meaning national, but really what it is tied to is culture. It's about the culture that someone identifies with. All right? And since we're studying the culture unit, makes sense. The next term, probably the longest definition that we have this entire school year. It's really, really long. And there's two parts here. I actually included two different definitions from two different textbooks because they get at two different elements that are both very, very important. And I, I, I didn't think that choosing one or the other was, was proper. So here are the two different definitions. Here's the first one. For race, identity Again, this is self-identification, identifying with a group of people descended from a biological ancestor. That's the first definition. Second definition is a categorization of humans based on skin color and other physical characteristics. Racial categories are social and political constructions because they are based on ideas that some biological differences, especially skin color, are more important than others, the example being given height, even though the latter might have more significance in terms of human activity. Now, this is where things get a little bit more controversial because from a biological standpoint, if we were in a biology class and we were talking about race, one thing that we would probably talk about is that biologically, there is no race that when you talk about race, you're talking about skin color, you're talking about pigmentation, that you're not looking at the, the cells of a person's body, you're not looking at their DNA. Because from DNA, you can't tell one person from another with different skin colors, all right? That's the biology side of this, all right? And we have to recognize that from a biological standpoint, that is true. That when looking at one's DNA, you can't tell if a person is black 
or white or, or, or any particular skin color. That is true from a biological standpoint. However, from a cultural standpoint, and remember that's what this unit is a part of, that's where the first definition comes from. Okay? And it's someone's identification and recognizing their ancestry, where, where their ancestors came from, and how strongly they identify with that ancestry. And so that's really important to understand because from a biological standpoint, it's true that, that race can't be discerned from looking under a microscope at DNA. However, from a cultural standpoint, it is still a really important part of people's identity. And so we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that, that some people are going to feel more strongly tied to their ancestry than they do to cultural patterns or processes. All right? That someone might feel more strong about their race than they do about their ethnicity. And so that's, that's an important element to discuss. So let's use a, an example here. All right? If we were to talk about African Americans as an ethnicity, it might be someone who identifies culturally with patterns and processes that go back to Africa. Whereas if we were to talk about it at, from a race standpoint, it might be someone who traces their ancestry back to Africa or African immigrants. So it is a very slight difference because obviously when people immigrate, a lot of times they're bringing with them their culture. So there's a lot to that. But I really want you guys to, to be able to differentiate there because again, notice in the definition of ethnicity, it includes ancestry. So is race a part of ethnicity? It is. But is it all of ethnicity? No, it's not. All right, it's the culture, it's the different elements that go into it. It's, it's language, it's religion, it's you know, folk and popular culture practices all tied together, which is part of the reason why this chapter is called ethnicity and not race or nationality or, or, or something else. All right. So now we take a look at nationality. Now I include ethnicity there as well so that we can kind of juxtapose those two, see them side by side. Again, definition of ethnicity, what this chapter is about, identity with a group of people that share a common ancestry and culture. Now, here's the definition of nationality. Keeping in mind what I mentioned on the last slide, these first two slides, these definitions of ethnicity, race, and nationality, really, really important to understand and be able to identify the subtle nuances between. And later on, even in just this lecture, we're going to have a, a really confusing topic between ethnicity and nationality. So you have to know the differences between these two. Okay? So here is the definition of nationality. Identity with a group of people that share legal attachment and personal allegiance to a particular place as a result of being born there. So... It's, it's attachment, it's identity with, and again, we're talking self-identity, with a particular place because of legal attachment. That legal attachment could be, for example, citizenship. If you're born in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. So you share that legal attachment to the United States. All right? But it's also personal allegiance. All right? Now, again, I want to remind you guys, that we're talking about self-identification. And different people might have a different hierarchy of what's most important to them. Some might identify much more with their nationality, where they are born and where they share legal attachment to over the, the cultural background of their ancestors or just even the biological ancestry that they have. Right. Uh, an example might be someone who identifies as an American, but someone from the same family who identifies as an Italian American. Is either one wrong? Well, no. They, if they were both born in the United States, they're both Americans. But somebody might have a stronger attachment to their ancestry, their cultural background. And so that's really important to understand that it, 
it gets really difficult and and I would say even risky to start judging people's self-identification, how they identify, what they feel strongly with. So you just want to be aware of that and, and be careful with that, all right? Because everyone's, how they identify is going to be a little bit different person by person. But we really need to know those definitions moving forward. All right, building on nationality, we have to take a look at a couple more definitions. We start out with nationalism, loyalty and devotion to a particular nationality. So, you know, typically as a result of sharing legal attachment to a particular place, now as that, as we start to see more loyalty and devotion to a particular place, that's now called nationalism. Nationalism is uh, an example of something that could be both a centripetal and centrifugal force. And these are two different definitions, and you absolutely will have to know them both. In fact, in class, we're going to take a look at an FRQ that asks us to differentiate between centripetal and centrifugal forces in South Asia. So we are going to look at that in class coming up. So here are some definitions that we need to be familiar with. Centripetal force. Forces tending to bind together the citizens of a state, thus promoting its unity. And then centrifugal forces are forces that tend to divide a country, threatening the unity of a state. So, to, to clarify, to build on this, to give you guys some synonyms for these. A centripetal force, it unifies, it stabilizes, it strengthens. We, we see it there. Binds together. It fosters solidarity. Right? Brings people together. Uh, a former student of mine said, think of it like a uh, you know, the, the way that they remembered the difference between these two were uh, petals on a flower. They all, they all come together right at the center of a, a flower. So you see centripetal, petals on a flower, they all come together. Okay? For some students, that's helped them to remember it. Centrifugal forces, they divide, they devolve, they, they break things down, they disrupt order, they destabilize, they weaken bonds. Uh, I had a former student who, when I asked them, how will you remember the difference between centripetal and centrifugal forces, they said, and uh, it, I'm not sure how super school appropriate it is, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and say it, but uh, they said, well, centrifugal, it's got F-U right in the middle. So if someone told me, F you, I wouldn't want to be around them anymore. It would divide us. So <laughs> when they told me that, I, I kind of stared at them as the class laughed. And, <laughs> and then I said that they were brilliant. And I asked if everyone would remember it that way. And everyone said they would. And I've told it to every class since, and everyone has seemed to remember it. So uh, I apologize, Mom and Dad, if that, you know, was not super appropriate. But as long as we remember centrifugal force, I hope it will be okay. So let's continue on with that concept of how nationalism can be both a centripetal or centrifugal force. Now remember, centripetal forces bring people together. They unify them. And so nationalism, which remember is that loyalty or devotion to a particular nationality, um, is something that tends to promote culture. It's something that can generate a lot of pride in that nationality as well as in national interest. On the flip side of that, nationalism as a centrifugal force, something that can divide people, is something that can be used at the expense of other people, other nationalities, other ethnicities, promoting one nationality over another, which would divide. Okay. Now, 
notice here we're not seeing positives and negatives. We're not seeing pros and cons, good and bad. Though we're going to see that that's the way that in the past this has been used. And the example that I'm going to use is from World War II, because in World War II, nationalism was used as both a centripetal and centrifugal force, depending on different groups of people. Okay. Now, on the centripetal side, on the unifying side, uh, leaders like Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and the other allied powers used nationalism to kind of unite and promote their countries and to spur them towards victory. Uh, in the United States, people were given rations and abided by those rations to help the war effort. You know, there were certain days that they went without meat so that meat could go to the war effort. There were certain days that they went without gas so the gas could go to the war effort. And people were willing to make those sacrifices in the interest of, of helping their country. And so that was something where, where a country came together, unified for a common cause. Now, on the flip side of that, the Axis powers used nationalism to convince their countries to, con to, to commit unspeakable atrocities, especially Hitler, convinced the German people to go along as six million Jews were murdered and invading other countries. And, and, and this was in the name of German nationalism. And so there, there are examples where nationalism can be used to unite but also divide. And so that's one of those things where it where a singular topic can be very polarizing and be on, on completely different ends of the spectrum. And, and that's where this class gets really kind of tricky is you take a single topic, but how it manifests itself in real life can be dramatically different. And that's just one example with nationalism as a centripetal or centrifugal force. Switching gears a little bit, we're now going to talk about a couple definitions that we'll introduce in this unit, but talk a lot more extensively about next unit when we start talking about political geography. So on this side, there's a couple definitions that we introduce and then a couple other terms that we'll see over the next few slides. The first term is state. Now, this differs quite a bit from the term that we use here in the United States because we use the term state to refer to our subnational unit. Starting now and for the rest of the year, when we refer to a state, we'll be talking about a politically organized territory that is administered by a sovereign government and is recognized by a significant portion of the international community. A state has a defined territory, a permanent population, a government, and is recognized by other states. So, in this case, a state is a synonym for country. So, to be clear right now, Canada is a state by this definition. Nevada is not. Nevada is a state as a subnational unit of the United States of America, but it is not a state because it lacks that very last part, recognized by other states. And that is a term we call sovereignty. It doesn't have complete sovereignty. And we're going to talk about that more in our next unit in political geography because it does have a certain degree of sovereignty but not complete. It's not recognized as separate and independent by other countries, by other states. Okay, So the state is the political term. So out to the side of there, write political. State is the political term. The next definition that you see there is nation. 
a tightly knit group of people possessing bonds of language, ethnicity, religion, and other shared cultural attributes. The nation, out to the side, right, culture. Right? That's the, the cultural group. And I really like, because the student body at Coronado High School is referred to as the Cougar Nation. We are a tightly knit group of people possessing bonds of language, ethnicity, religion, maybe not so much that, but other shared cultural attributes. We're all part of Coronado High School. We all wear the same colors. We all cheer for the same teams, all those things. So we're, we're bound together. We're all part of the Cougar Nation. So that's the cultural element of it. Okay, so we have the political, that's the state, and we have the nation, that's the cultural. And so there's several different combinations of how these can manifest themselves. Okay, so we're going to see nation states, where the state and the nation match up. We're going to see multi-state nations. We're going to see multinational states and stateless nations. If you're like, whoa, 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 that's just a lot of different states and nations and things like that. Don't worry, we're going to look at each definition. We're going to provide examples all those different things as we look at this, and then we'll take a look at examples in class as well. So let's start out with nation states. Here's the definition. A state whose territory is identical to that occupied by a single particular ethnic group or nation. Okay, so I want you guys to, to, to think of this visual. Okay, We said we have the state on one hand, that's the political. And we have the nation on the other hand, and that's the cultural. Now, we're going to literally use our two hands. So, if one hand is political and one hand is cultural, when those two come together, palm to palm, everything matching up perfectly, that's a nation state. It's when the boundaries of the political match up with the boundaries of the cultural perfectly. When the state meets the nation, you have a nation state. That's the definition. And largely nation states began to emerge in Europe during the 19th century, and there's different theories as to why. Some are economic in nature, saying that they were based on trade and things like that. Others say that they were based on uh, political power, uh, others are cultural in nature, that people started to gravitate towards one another and wanted sovereignty, wanted political control. So there's different theories as to why. But you can see the emergence, more and more countries beginning to emerge uh, in Europe. And a lot of the examples of nation states come out of Europe. Now, to be clear, there are no perfect nation states. Because take a look at that definition. A state whose territory is identical to that occupied by a single particular ethnic group or nation. Is there going to be any country where it is 100% completely homogenous? No. Doesn't exist. Right? But there are some countries that are really homogenous, very homogenous, and where most of the people in that country are a particular ethnic group, all right? So a couple examples, you definitely want to have examples. Uh, an example might be Iceland, Denmark, Poland, Japan, okay? So to give you an example outside of Europe, all right? Because, you know, for example, most people living in Iceland are Icelandic. And there's not a lot of people who are Icelandic, ethnically Icelandic, outside of Iceland. There's some people that might trace their ancestry back there, but again, we're talking about ethnicity and cultural practices and things like that, so we're not seeing a lot of that outside of Iceland. It's fairly homogenous. And that's what a nation state is, is where it's fairly homogenous and not very widespread. All right, and the political matches up with the cultural. That's a nation state. Make sure that you have those examples. Iceland, Denmark, Poland, Japan. Good examples of nation states. A multi-state nation, just take a look at that term right there. 
multi-state nation. There's going to be multiple political units within a single cultural boundary. Here's the definition. A nation that stretches across the borders and across states. Now, sometimes you may see this called a part nation state, okay, or part nation state. Now, a good example, I, I, I think multi-state nation is a little bit more intuitive, like it makes sense just in the title, multi-state nation. You have a single nation, it stretches across multiple states, okay, multiple political boundaries. And a good example of that would be the Arab nation. Again, remember from our religion chapter that Arab is an ethnicity okay, and doesn't necessarily match up with being Muslim. But it, it, there is some overlap. Okay? The Arab nation, you can see, people that ethnically identify as being Arab, and we can see that it stretches across multiple political entities, across multiple countries, multiple states. This is a multi-state nation. All right, so now we are on to multinational states. Here's where things get kind of tricky. All right, put a big star next to this because this has been tricky for students for years now. So I would love to hear a student come up with uh, a way that they're going to remember the difference. All right, so maybe come up with something. Be, be prepared to share it with a classmate. Here we go. Multi-ethnic state. A state that contains more than one ethnicity. Makes sense from the definition. Multi-ethnic, multiple ethnicities. Single state. Right. Good example of a multi-ethnic state is the United States of America. The U.S. has multiple ethnicities, generally identifying as a single nationality. People who are born in the United States, by and large, identify as being American. Not everyone, because we can't speak for everyone. Remember, this is about self-identification. Somebody might identify more with their ethnic heritage, their cultural heritage. Somebody might identify more with their ancestral heritage. So we can't speak for everyone. But by and large, most people that are born here in the United States identify as being American. Okay? That's multi-ethnic. Multiple ethnicities, one state. Multinational state. State that contains two or more ethnic groups with traditions of self-determination that agree to coexist peacefully by recognizing each other as distinct nationalities. Multinational state, multiple nationalities. Now, in order to be a multinational state, you have to be multi-ethnic. Take a look at the definition. Two or more ethnic groups has to be multi-ethnic. But here's the tricky part. Not every multi-ethnic state is a multinational state. The U.S. isn't. The U.S. is multi-ethnic. We have multiple ethnicities, but only a single nationality for people who are born here. Whereas in other countries, in other states, they might have multiple nationalities. I'll give you a couple examples. The United Kingdom is a multinational state. The former Soviet Union, even currently Russia, is a multinational state because there are multiple nationalities granting a greater degree of autonomy, of sovereignty, the ability to govern themselves. What we see is self-determination down at the bottom. So let's take a look at those examples. In the United Kingdom, there are four distinct nationalities. There is English, corresponding with England, which you see in the map there. Then there's also Wales. You can see that on the western part of Great Britain. The ethnicity, the nationality associated with that is Welsh. Scottish from Scotland in the northern part of Great Britain. And Irish is also part of the United Kingdom because Northern Ireland is part of the UK. So there are four distinct nationalities in the United Kingdom, a single state, four different nationalities. People will identify as English, as Welsh, as Scottish, as Irish, but as citizens of the United Kingdom, a single state. 
And there is a certain degree of autonomy. A few years ago, Scotland voted whether or not they were going to break away. Did they want to become their own separate, sovereign, independent country? They ultimately voted not to. But part of the reason why they didn't is the United Kingdom, the government of the UK, offered to grant greater autonomy, greater sovereignty, greater decision-making, greater self-determination to the people of Scotland. That's a good example of a multinational state. The former Soviet Union was a multinational state. And when the Soviet Union broke up, it became 15 different countries based on the 15 republics. And those 15 republics were largely based on the 15 largest nationalities within the Soviet Union. And so each of those became their own separate sovereign country. And to be clear, Russia is still a multinational state because there are still nationalities within Russia that are that that are are, are distinct in their their own right and we're going to look at a couple here in just a couple minutes last example for tonight is stateless nations last definition okay. a stateless nation is a nation that does not have a state okay. this is a group of people a nation that lacks the political entity. They don't have their own political entity. So here are a couple different examples that we can see here. Uh, the Kurds and Assyrian Christians in Iraq, Palestinians, the Romani, the Basques, and Chechens are examples of stateless nations. We're going to look at each of those. You can see there on the map of Iraq, that we can see different religious and ethnic groups throughout Iraq. And remember that Iraq, largely in the south, the part bordering on the Republic of Iran, is predominantly Shia Muslim. Okay? And then in the northern and western parts of the country, it's predominantly Sunni. But you can see up north, kind of the northeast part, that gray, that's the area occupied by the Kurds. Now the Kurds are a particular ethnic group that is spread across four different states. Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. And some political geographers have speculated that an independent Kurdistan could emerge in the future. And if you take a look at the map, could you see where perhaps the boundaries of Kurdistan could be? Now, side note, kind of a trivia fact, but Stan is for example in this case Kurdistan is means land of so in this case land of the Kurds okay? uh, it means the the same thing with uh, Kazakhstan land of the Kazakhs okay and so it tends to be associated with more um, with ethnic groups and things like that but could an independent Kurdistan exist some speculate that it has already started to happen because of the Syrian civil war. The Kurds have declared their independence from Syria. And so we'll, we'll continue talking about the Kurds as, as we move forward. This is an example that, that has come up and continues to come up throughout uh, the, the year. Palestinians. In the country of Israel, the Palestinian people do not have their own state. And there have been attempts, the Oslo Accords are perhaps the, the closest example of reaching a two-state solution for the Palestinians and Israelis to, to grant each of them their own state. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but within the last few years, uh, the Palestinian leadership has been granted greater recognition by the United Nations. It's actually recognized as a non-member observer state at this point by the United Nations. And so moving a little bit closer to statehood, a little bit closer to not being a stateless nation. And then taking a look a little bit closer here at the West Bank, uh, and that's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Uh, that's a territory, a Palestinian territory, in the country of Israel. And that's predominantly where uh, many Palestinian people uh, live. 
and you can also see the Gaza Strip down in the southern west part of Israel as well. The Romani people, or Roma, uh, widely actually referred to as gypsies. Uh, when we take a look at this, this is a group of people who lack their own political entity. They are a stateless nation. And the Romani or the Roma people uh, you might find throughout, uh, predominantly through Europe, but especially uh, Eastern Europe, but to a certain extent, uh, there's a fairly large Romani population in Western Europe as well. The Basque region, we mentioned this during our language unit. The Basque language is a isolated language. It is isolated from Indo-European. And the Basque region of northern Spain, southern France, is an example of a stateless nation. The Basque people do not have their own political entity. And back to Russia, remember we said that Russia is still a multinational state. There are multiple nationalities within this single state. And the Chechens are a distinct nationality, as well as the Dagestani, as well as many others, in the southern part of Russia. And even when the Soviet Union broke up in 15 independent states, largely uh, that were based on the, the 15 Soviet republics, which were then largely based on the largest nationalities within the Soviet Union. Um, even when they broke up and those 15 republics became 15 independent states, there were still nationalities that did not get statehood. And the Chechens are a good example of that. And they are seeking statehood. They want to break away from Russia to a, to a large extent. And there's been a lot of violence and conflict uh, in Chechnya and, and along the border there with Georgia as well. Um, and we're going to take a look at that a little bit closer in class with a video case study that ref that talks about Dagestan there to the, the east uh, that borders on the Caspian Sea, as well as Chechnya that you see highlighted there. And we'll see you guys in class to finish this up and to take a look at a few video case studies. Have a good night, everyone.